Welcome back, everyone. Good evening. Glad you came back for our fifth and final session uh, on the, the topic tonight is legacy. We're going to be looking at actually two different parts of, of legacy. The first is um, the humor of the Queen, and then we're going to look at her, her legacy in terms of passing the faith down to the next generation. Those are the two topics that came up in our, our readings for this past week. So, um, this is the fifth and final session, and tonight we're talking about chapters 9 and 10, or at least we're, we're sort of uh, talking about some of the themes that come up in those two chapters. Um, for those of you, oops, made a mistake there, it should say chapters 9 and 10 at the top. Uh, reflections on chapters 9 and 10. For those of you who have the book and were able to do reading, any, any initial reflections on what you read? Thoughts? Questions? things that were interesting to you, chapters 9 and 10. So the first one was wit and wisdom, and then the chapter 10 was mystery and majesty, endowing a legacy for future generations. So. You just had a great sense of humor. Yeah, that comes through, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so the thing that struck me yep. is um, PJ in, in the um, last Sunday, when I was at the eighth, I assumed he did the same sermon for the 10.30. Yep, it was. So he's mentioning the disciples and the fact that they were really slow to kind of get it, if you like. But when I read this, I couldn't help thinking about the fact that those three years for them were a whirlwind three years. Okay, so there's a picture in the book, so it kind of is related to the book. You don't have to see them in church last Sunday. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's the picture of the little girl that broke ranks, I suppose, right. isn't it? Yeah. And then you've got the thing of the... Um, but it, the, the little, there was a little girl who, they say, she broke ranks. And there's all this protocol. Obviously, the queen arrives. She's all terribly important. So there's what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. And a little girl kind of breaks out of <laughs> breaks out of the ranks and gives her a rose, I think it is, or something. There's a picture of, of her in, in this little book. And, but it, it made me think of the disciples that, for me, I had previously thought of them as having this, they're sitting there, at the, you know, they're at Jesus' feet, they're hearing all that, they're having a very spiritual tongue. But actually, a lot of what they were doing is like bodyguards and crowd control and deciding like who can approach Jesus who can't and you know just thinking it has to be it, it made me think of that honestly oh, and, interesting. Uh, and uh, no wonder they they didn't have time to uh, I, I just said uh, you don't think of disciples as being bodyguards in charge of crowd control like who can who can't and, you think how many stories in the Gospels, such as, I don't know. Um, Let the little trembling come to me. Uh, 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 yeah, well, there's blind Bartimaeus. Yeah, yeah. Bartimaeus and children, yeah. you know, and they, and they always say, hey, you can't do that, you can't do that. It's not protocol. And, you know, anyway, that's yeah. not the kind of thoughts. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. We're going to look at, um, that, that's going to come up in a few minutes here. Um, the thing about protocol and breaking protocol, yeah. Anything else that just any random reflections or thoughts you had when you re did your readings this week? Okay. And then I just realized I left my notes upstairs. I don't have my notes, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, hopefully I can remember some of the details about some of the things we're going to talk about. I may, I may not be able to remember because I don't have it written down in front of me here. But um, So we're going to start off uh, today with a little greeting from the author of our book. So, Greetings members of St. Olive's Parish there in Toronto. Thank you so much for reading and discussing my book, The Faith of Queen Elizabeth. I was delighted when Reverend Mitchell reached out and asked if I could share a word with you as you conclude your study. I understand this week's lesson is on legacy, and that seems very fitting when we consider the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I first was drawn to writing about her faith several years ago as I reflected on various heroes, spiritual heroes, who 
had a surprising kind of faith because of their platform or their role, and certainly Her Majesty um, fit that description. In some sense, she was obligated in doing her duty to be the head of the Church of England and to have a, a faith as a kind of uh, leader. But Her Majesty made it very personal and clearly demonstrated that time and time again in her interactions with individuals, with her interactions with uh, various charities and groups and nonprofits, and just in her attitude, um, one that always was inclusive, respectful, compassionate. And I think that will indeed be her legacy, the one that will continue to inspire us to realize that we can do our part, however small it may seem, we all have something to give. We all need one another. Thank you, St. Olives, for reading The Faith of Queen Elizabeth. May God bless you all, and may the joy of Easter reside in your hearts. Thank you. I thought that was sort of fun. I, I just uh, took a chance and emailed him, and he, he said he'd be happy to do that for us. So, yeah. He's in, um, uh, what state is it? I can't remember. I think it says on the, on the cover, the jacket cover, not Tennessee, but mm, I don't think so. Does it say? Tennessee. Oh, it is Tennessee. Okay. There you go. So that was very kind of him to. to yeah. He does a bit. Yeah, doesn't he? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, let's take a look at our first scripture passage today. Um, can I have a, a volunteer to read this for us? Janice? Okay. We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered, and a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up, and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while, until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, and were not a little comforted. <laughs> so I, I included this story because it's, it's, it's uh, we don't often think of the Bible as being funny, but this is actually a kind of a dark, darkly comic story. So, and, and some of the translations are actually even funnier because they say things like, you know, Paul was going on and on and on in his sermon. So Paul is preaching this long, boring sermon, and everybody's sort of astutely sort of, you know, they're sitting there looking very kind of pious. And then this poor guy, Eutychus, falls out of the window because he falls asleep. And, uh, and it's, not, it's, it's never been clear whether he actually was dead or he just sort of looked like he was dead. It's the, some bi Bibles will put the heading is that uh, Paul uh, raises, you know, something like a, a young man is raised from the dead. I'm not sure whether he actually died or he just sort of... Yeah, it's a little unclear. But anyway, I, I just thought that this is one of my favorite stories as well because it's funny. And uh, it's going to lead into, we're going to look at a series of clips about the queen and sort of the lighter side of the queen. So this will include some episodes of when protocol was broken. We got a few of those. And then there's a, a little video just about some humorous things that uh, the queen was captured saying on on video. Um, and so this is one of the themes of, of Delft's uh, chapter 9. And so uh, we're going to dive into this. And I think this shows um, a nice side of her that uh, we don't always get to see. So move on to the first one. So the first one which Delft's talked about is this encounter she had with Alice Fraser back in 1991. And again, I don't have my notes in front of me, but she was, um, Alice was uh, living in DC in, a, in, a, in an impoverished area. And the queen was on a tour and she went to see her and Alice broke uh, protocol by giving the queen a big hug when she came into her home. And so there's a little, this is a little news story about that. Um, it's kind of charming. 
The Queen spent plenty of time with presidents and dignitaries. A cheer went up as the limousines pulled up on Drake Place. But in May 1991, the monarch set out to meet some real Washingtonians. This is the car she came in. Residents of a southeast neighborhood plagued by drug violence, living in new homes built and financed for people struggling to climb out of poverty. Then Mayor Sharon Pratt led the tour. You can't do this. You are to shake the queen's hand unless she extends it. But that was not Alice Fraser's way. She might come in here, I'll shake her hand, give her a hug. And so she did. My mother just hugged her. And what did you think? And everybody was shocked. Everybody's eyes went got big. <laughs> they were surprised. Your mom's picture was all over, all over the, world. the world. But mm -hmm. the queen didn't seem to mind. No, she was nice about it. Frazier had been up all night cooking, and she invited Queen Elizabeth and First Lady Barbara Bush for lunch. She offered her some potato salad and chicken. And the queen and the First Lady said, they declined. Were they missing out on something special? Oh, yeah, that's my, that's my mother's favorite <laughs> recipe. The queen then took a walk through the neighborhood. I think she was wonderful. The block renamed the Queen's Stroll. The sign still up, and Alice Fraser's daughter will never forget her brush with majesty. Oh, it meant the whole night. My mom, I mean, she was on cloud nine the whole week. Queen Elizabeth a sovereign with a remarkable ability to connect with all the rest of us. At the British Embassy, Bruce Lachan, WUSA 9. So that's, that's a cute story. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we've got a few more of those. Uh, I don't know if you remember these. There's, I've got one of Michelle Obama as well as one of Barack Obama, both kind of making some faux pas, or, or not faux pas, but um, you know, breaking code protocol. I don't know if you remember this. So this is back in 2009. I think this is at uh, Buckingham Palace, I believe. I think it was a G20 meeting. Um, and you can see there what's happening. Well, this is sort of a no-no. But when you listen to this, the guy he that's sort of commenti commenting on this, he thinks that the Queen reached out first. So let's see if that's true. Let's see. What is astounding is the picture of the Queen with her arm round Michelle Obama. Um, and Michelle Obama's uh, hand around the Queen too, but the Queen made the first move. This is the most astounding thing because the Queen is not known for being touchy-feely. Indeed, her son, Prince Charles, uh, complained on one occasion that he wasn't given enough affection when he was a child. The big deal is that the Queen is an almost sacred person. Uh, in monarchies, uh, there's a sacredness that surrounds the sovereign, which is perhaps not known in uh, republics, at least not all the time, in the way that it is in um, a monarchy and she's been on the throne for a very, very long time. She is herself a very dignified person, all the more so because of her relatively short stature, one of the things one saw yesterday. It was the way Obama and Michelle towered over the Queen and indeed Prince Philip. He is six foot one, she's five foot four. There's an awful lot of difference in inches there. Yes, it's a very significant gesture. She's not known for this kind of thing. Uh, when Paul Keating, the Australian politician, put his hand in the small of her back, let us put it no lower than that, uh, some years ago, all hell broke loose. Now she's doing the same thing to the First Lady. And for all I know, this is a breach of White House protocol. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. And... Uh, Here's another one, um, which Delphs talks about, which is actually also very cute. So this is the opening of the, a new BBC headquarters in 2013. And the Queen was there to, to do a tour. And, and it's a little unclear why this happened, but she ends up coming, you can see in the, the still there, that she ends up coming in behind the announcers um, at, while they're doing their live broadcast. And she's sort of standing there looking at them through. So it's quite, it's quite cute. Uh, so here we go. In just a moment, the Queen will be shown the studio from the BBC News Channel and on air there, Julia Morica and Sophie Long, and uh, the Queen is about to be shown there. It'll take a bit longer than perhaps was planned because of the media scrum that's developed at the top of the newsroom there, but uh, let's join the Queen now. Welcome uh, Her Majesty the Queen to the heart of BBC Broadcasting House and our live newsroom. Yes, it's a view that we share with our audience every day, but today a unique uh, moment with a very special royal guest.
That is one of the most bizarre bits of television that the BBC has produced for some time. As the Queen makes her way past the BBC News Channel studio, you heard the roar, the spontaneous roar from the journalists within the newsroom uh, for what may well be the image of the day as the Queen pose behind the news readers, Julia Morica there and Sophie Long. And, and then this one, um, I don't actually remember this one, but I, um, I came across it. And uh, so you'll see here, what happens is that Obama's toast, making a toast. Again, again this is, uh, I believe this is at Buckingham Palace, but um, he's making a toast to the Queen and then God Save the Queen starts. And he doesn't know what to do, so he keeps talking over God Save the Queen, and he's sort of holding up his, and nobody's, nobody responds because they're waiting for God Save the Queen to be finished. And then, then she raises her glass. Um, so it's, it's just kind of a funny moment. Let's see. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand with me and raise your glasses as I propose a toast. To Her Majesty the Queen, to the vitality of the special relationship between our peoples and, in the words of Shakespeare, to this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, to the Queen. It's just totally dead. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, now we can do it. <laughs> she must have thought that was hilarious, I'm sure. Yeah. And he's got a very good sense of humor, too. And he, uh, I, I, again, I didn't bring my notes, but he's, he said something funny like, uh, well, I thought it gave a nice dramatic crescendo to my, to my words. He thought it, <laughs> it did, actually. It kind of sounded very dramatic as it was, yeah. But anyway, very cute. Um, and then this is a... a this is a, a little sort of montage I came across uh, from The Guardian, um, just sort of putting together some clips of, of funny little things that happened with the Queen. So we start here with, this is the um, interaction she had with Paddington Bear. And this was, I believe, this is the opening, uh, this was sort of opening the Platinum Jubilee celebrations, I believe. It was like a little, I think that's right. And then we'll also see there's a little clip from the Olympics, the London Olympics, which she did with uh, Daniel Craig. Craig, Greg, Craig. Um, and then a few other little um, things that were caught on camera that, that shows her, her lighter side, so. Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Oh. For later. Clothes wise, does it look all right with the yes, I was background? Um, yes, it does. It's, it's I mean, Johnny it's like it'd be awful if you said no, because I don't know <laughs> something else. <laughs> Did you catch that? Should, yeah. Uh, hold on. Hold on. I just pause it here. It goes fast. Uh, yeah, the Queen said, "Does uh, she, what did she say? Is it supposed to look like we're enjoying ourselves?" And then Boris Johnson said something like, "Yes." And despite appearances, we are enjoying ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> They looked very stiff, though, sitting there, didn't they? Go and look. Even he will admit his 19 minutes with the Queen in the garden of Buckingham Palace was something quite, quite different. This is David Attenborough. From chatting about the trees the Queen planted for her children to joking about the noise of the helicopters in the skies of London. It sounds like President Trump. It sounds like President Trump. Obama. <laughs> I was going to say, a sundial neatly planted in the shade. Isn't it good, yes. yes. <laughs> Had we thought of that, that it was planted in the shade? It wasn't in the shade originally, I'm sure. Oh, message? Yeah, from Michelle. 
Yeah. Oh, very yeah. amusing. So, would you like to watch it together? Yes. Let's have a look. Hey, Prince Harry, remember when you told us to bring it at the Invictus Games? Careful what you wish for. Boom. Oh, really? Please. Boom. Canada's Justin Trudeau reminded her that he was the country's 12th Prime Minister to serve during her reign. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister of Canada, for making me feel so old. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Bond. Good evening, Your Majesty. Film, happy and glorious, specially made for the ceremony by the BBC, it does suggest a royal arrival unlike any we've ever seen. The party is about to start, Your Majesty. Happy Jubilee, ma'am. And thank you for everything. That's very kind. That's sweet. Oh, and then this is one that, uh, this is the last one in this topic about humor. Um, this is one that Kathy mentioned last, I think last week, um, and I was able to find the clip for it and I thought I would share it with you. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's somebody telling the story of what happened, um, but I won't give it away here. Um, this is, oh, again, I don't have my notes with it, but this is a gentleman who was one of her, kind of her security people telling the story. This is just after she died. One of my favourite stories is when we were at Balmoral and the Queen used to go up there in May to Craigowan House and just stay there privately for a weekend and she would go up at lunchtime for picnics and very often it would just be the police officer and Her Majesty and one of the picnics I went out with her, we had a lovely picnic and a lovely chat and then we went for a little walk, just the two of us and normally on these picnic sites you, you meet nobody but there was two hikers coming towards us and the Queen would always stop and say hello. And it was two Americans on a walking holiday. And it was clear from the moment that we first stopped they hadn't recognised the Queen, which is fine. And the American gentleman was telling the Queen where he came from, where they were going to next, and where they'd been to in Britain. And I could see it coming and sure enough, he said to Her Majesty, and where do you live? <laughs> and she said, well, I live in London, but I've got a holiday home just the other side of the hills. <laughs> And he said, well, how often have you been coming up here? Oh, she said, I've been coming up here ever since I was a little girl, so over 80 years. And you could see the clogs thinking. And he said, well, if you've been coming up here for 80 years, you must have met the Queen. I and as it. quick as a flash, says, well, I haven't, but Dick here meets her regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy said to me, oh, you've met the Queen, what's she like? And because I was with her a long time and I knew I could pull a leg, I said, oh, she can be very cantankerous at times, <laughs> but she's got a lovely sense of humour. Anyway, the next thing I knew, this guy comes round, puts his arm around my shoulder, and before I could see what was happening, he gets his camera, gives it to the Queen, and says, can you take a picture of the two of us? <laughs> anyway, we swapped places, and I took a picture of them with the Queen, and we never let on, and we waved goodbye. And then Her Majesty said to me, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when he shows us photographs to the friends in America and hopefully someone tells him who I am. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> I don't know whether that person's ever been identified or you're probably too ashamed to come forward. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, so moving on now. So that was that was the Queen's humor. Now we're going to move on a little bit. Um, so we've got another reading. This one is from Hebrews. Could I get a volunteer to read this for us? Joan, would you? That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Okay, thank you. This is a particularly beautiful passage from Epistle to the Hebrews, and um, well known, especially that first line, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Queen's faith. I mean, that's been the topic all along, but we're going to look at that a little more carefully. And um, Delphs, <clears throat> Delphs talks about her relationship with Billy Graham, and so we're going to look at that a little bit. And um, so... The Billy Graham crusade to, to Greater London was in 1954, and it was, I believe, a 12-week crusade that went from March until May, and was pretty important. Um, hundreds of thousands of people came to various different, uh, like, packed arenas full of people um, to hear him speak and to hear the other events that were going on. And uh, as, as we, I think Delphs mentioned this, um, the Queen actually heard him speak at the first opening night and she was very moved by it and she developed this relationship with him, friendship with him over that lasted over the years of their lives. Um, and I, I think he was quite influential in, in her faith development as a Christian. So this is a couple of just historic clips. These are just very short. This is the opening night and then there's another one from the closing night. I thought I would just show those to you. They're just about a minute long just to give you a sense of, of what that was like. And then there's a shorter, uh, or there's a short um, interview with Billy Graham's son um, talking about his relationship with the Queen. So here we go. So this is opening night, March, uh, the 1st of March. Go newsreel. The mighty Haringey Arena in London draws a capacity crowd of over 11,000 for the first meeting in Britain of the American evangelist team headed by Billy Graham. Graham, who wears a slate gray suit and a modest tie, makes his address from a purple-draped platform. I'm not going to deliver my message now, but just to say a word of greeting to you that are here tonight. We're delighted tonight to have these newspaper people here. It's been a long time. Uh, perhaps you can see them.
It's been a long time since evangelism and revival and Christ and God was front page news around the world. And we thank God for it. Billy Graham's unorthodox methods may not be to all tastes, but he and his team, backed by a choir of nearly 2,000 voices, believe they will fill Haringey each night during their three months' crusade in London. So that's opening night, and uh, and then this is from the closing, uh, the newsreel of the closing session. Out. This is th three months later. The football pitch takes the overflow as a hundred and twenty thousand pack Wembley Stadium. From all over Britain, people have come to the final meeting of Billy Graham's Greater London Crusade. Bishop of Canterbury is with Dr. Graham. Many distinguished personalities, including Mr. Horbelisha, are present. Billy Graham has spoken to more than one and a half million people during his three months campaign. Now he sums up his crusade. Our political and military leaders have said repeatedly they do not know the answer to the present world dilemma. This uncertainty is beginning to penetrate to the man on the street. The average man must turn somewhere. He must have some faith and hope to hold on to. Thousands are turning to God and are finding peace, security, happiness, and joy in this age of uncertainty and confusion. As the massed choirs sing a version of the Lord's Prayer, hundreds come forward to declare that they have accepted Christ. Billy Graham and his team have made their contribution towards filling the churches of Britain which have long been almost empty. So interesting. Uh, interesting what he said there about the churches have long been empty. We always think of the 1950s, the churches being full of people, but I guess that wasn't the case. Uh, especially, I, I suppose, after during the war years, especially. But uh, um, okay. And then this is um, this is an interview. Um, this is, I believe, just after she died. This is an interview with his son. Um, Franklin. No one in Britain has ever been more cordial toward us than Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Those words from the man known as America's pastor, the late Reverend Billy Graham. The influential evangelist began his worldwide mission in London in the 1950s and affectionately writes about his relationship with Queen Elizabeth II in his autobiography, Just As I Am. It was after Graham preached in London's Haringey Arena in 1954, Queen Elizabeth II was so captivated by his message, she and Prince Philip invited him to preach the following year in their private chapel at the Royal Lodge in Windsor. Their spiritual connection carried on for decades. I now have the privilege to bring in the Reverend Franklin Graham to not only tell us more about the monarch and the minister, but also his own reflections on Her Majesty and her faith. Franklin, great to see you. Good to see you, Kira. So first of all, I, I know how you have always appreciated Queen Elizabeth's life of integrity. What are your thoughts today, Franklin, as we hear uh, more about her life and honor her life? Well, I, I watched today and I just had a thankful heart, uh, thankful that she was faithful. Uh, she was faithful and uh, steadfast in her faith in God and uh, for her many years, 70 years on the throne, uh, she honored the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and uh, she wasn't afraid uh, to live her faith. And so not only did she proclaim her faith, but she lived it, Kira. And that's what's so important, that she lived it and believed it. And uh, my father uh, knew her in a very special way. They'd been together on many occasions. And uh, every time they were together, she would want to talk about Scripture. Uh, and if my father had preached, uh, she would ask more detail about his message and what made him want to preach that uh, sermon versus another one and so forth. And uh, they had great Bible, I'd say, Bible studies together. And so um, she will be missed. Uh, she'll never be replaced. Uh, there's, uh, she's, I'm 70 years old, Kira, so my entire <laughs> life she has been queen. <laughs> No, and I remember, Franklin, your father mentioning the queen to me in, in, in our last interview. And, um, and he, he actually talked about her and that, uh, that she drew spiritual uh, comfort uh, from him. Do you believe that she ever sought advice? Well, well, I know on one occasion, uh, my father was in London and uh, she was getting ready to do her Christmas, uh, where they filmed her Christmas message that went not only throughout the UK, but around the world. And uh, she was wanting to use an illustration uh, where you throw a stone in the, in the water and the, then the ripples from that stone uh, go out and further and further and further. And so she asked my father to uh, come over and uh, as she was re uh, as she was rehearsing this, and she was wanting to get my father's opinion about her message. So my father went over and they spent time together and, uh, and he thought what she had to say was excellent. So I'm not sure he added anything, but uh, at least uh, <laughs> she wanted his opinion. In the 90s, your, your father helped her also with her Christmas broadcast that she would do. And in 1995, on Easter Sunday specifically, he gave the sermon in the royal family's private chapel. What were those experiences like for him, Franklin? Well, you know, my father uh, was around a lot of, of course, uh, very famous people. But uh, he said uh, to me that uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, was uh, an extremely humble person. And uh, my mother and father had spent the night uh, at the palace uh, one, one day, and they were coming down, I think it was uh, walking over to the kitchen to have, uh, to have breakfast, and there was a, a woman in an old raincoat with a scarf bent over feeding the dogs, and they thought it was uh, some of the help. And she <laughs> stood up, and it was the queen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, my father just uh, he remarked time and time again she was a very humble and gracious uh, individual. So in uh, your for him, it was just a privilege to know her. And, and he even wrote about her in his autobiography. I just want to read a part from that uh, in, his, in his book, Just As, As I Am. He said, I always found her to be very interested in the Bible and its message. After preaching at Windsor one Sunday, I was sitting next to the queen at lunch. I told her I'd been undecided until the last minute about my choice of sermon and had almost preached on the healing of the crippled man in John 5. Her eyes sparkled and she bubbled over with enthusiasm as she could do on a Occasion. I wish you had, she exclaimed. That is my favorite story. It's, it really is incredible, this connection that they had, because you don't hear about those sort of personal moments um, with the queen very often. And, and Kira, the, the, the personal connection was God and his word. And that, that's what brought them together. And that, that was what they had in common, was God's word. And she had a love for the Word of God. My father had a love for the Word of God. And of course, uh, they loved talking about the Word of God together. So, uh, and of course, for the church around the world, she was not only an inspiration, but an example to the church. And uh, she had incredible influence. And I, you know, I don't know what will happen as we go forward now, but for the last 70 years, to have somebody that, that steadfast in their faith at that level uh, of world influence is incredible. She, we, we will miss her. One more question, Franklin. You know, during Her Majesty's funeral today, the Dean of Westminster said of the Queen that her allegiance to God was given before any person gained allegiance to her. How do you think her deep sense of faith helped her as a leader? And how did you see evidence of her faith as she led? 
Well, Kira, if you, if you just look at the way she lived her life, uh, she just was uh, such an example. And uh, she did, she put God first. And she was never afraid uh, to, to share her faith. And so, uh, you know, that if, if, when you see politicians and you see world leaders today, uh, many of them, uh, you know, distance themselves from their faith. She didn't. And, uh, and that just had an impact on not only, I think, many people in my generation, uh, but for maybe some generations to come. And I hope the people of the UK will not forget uh, their heritage and the faith of their queen. So, yeah, is that something you were familiar with, that, that connection with uh, Billy Graham? And, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, speaking of um, passing down the faith to the next generation, so this is a reading from Deuteronomy, um, and it's sort of about that idea of, of telling the story to future generations so that they will remember what God has done. Um, and so this is, you know, related to the Exodus and all the things that God did for the people, for the Israelites. Um, so can I have a, a volunteer to read that? Kathy, would you? Okay, great. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes and rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you're going over to possess it that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord the God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house, and on your gates. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land, and he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give you with great and good cities that you did not build and houses full of, of all good things that you did not fill and cisterns that you did not dig and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. It is the Lord your God who shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. Okay. So this is, um, as you probably know, Orthodox Jews, you know, they have that, um, I forget the term for it, but the, that, that little box, and it, it has the, a quote from this scripture. It talks about um, binding this to your arm as a front lip between your eyes. So, um, but this is about remembering and passing down uh, the faith. Well, uh, you know, for passing down the story, in this case, of what God has done for his people to your son and your son's son. Speaking of whom... Um, is this gentleman, uh, the king. And um, <clears throat> so the king's, the king's faith, and we're talking about legacy here, passing down the faith to the next generation. The king's faith um, has always been somewhat uh, kind of unclear and uh, perhaps still is a little bit, but um, we've got a couple of things here. One is, this is his first speech after um, the queen died, and then there'll, there'll be uh, an excerpt from his first Christmas message as well, where he references in... Um, I would say in, in clear terms, but, um, you know, uh, you can be the judge. He, he references his faith and the faith 
um, and we can see what we think after this. So this is his first speech after the Queen died. When the Queen came to the throne, Britain and the world were still coping with the privations and aftermath of the Second World War, and still living by the conventions of earlier times. In the course of the last 70 years, we have seen our society become one of many cultures and many faiths. The institutions of the state have changed in turn. But through all changes and challenges, our nation and the wider family of realms, of whose talents, traditions, and achievements I am so inexpressibly proud, have prospered and flourished. Our values have remained, and must remain, constant. The role and the duties of monarchy also remain, as does the sovereign's particular relationship and responsibility towards the Church of England, the church in which my own faith is so deeply rooted. In that faith and the values it inspires, I have been brought up to cherish a sense of duty to others and to hold in the greatest respect the precious traditions, freedoms and responsibilities of our unique history and our system of parliamentary government. As the Queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love, as I have throughout my life. So what do you make of that, what he said there? So he, he sort of reaffirmed his, his role as head of, the, or, you know, um, yeah, head of the Church of England, and he referenced his own faith. Um, and how he was formed in the Anglican Church. But there he, you know, I, I, maybe not as strongly as the Queen has done, but he, you know, he did seem to be saying some of the right things. Here's now... Uh, she's a very hard act to follow. She is. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. She didn't seem to have his conflict in her approach to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this is, uh, again, a little snippet from his Christmas message. Um, and let me know what you think about this one. In the much-loved carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, we sing of how in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. My mother's belief in the power of that light was an essential part of her faith in God but also her faith in people, and it is one which I share with my whole heart. It is a belief in the extraordinary ability of each person to touch with goodness and compassion the lives of others and to shine a light in the world around them. This is the essence of our community and the very foundation of our society. We see it in the selfless dedication of our armed forces and emergency services who work tirelessly to keep us all safe and who perform so magnificently as we mourn the passing of our late queen. We see it in our health and social care professionals, our teachers and indeed all those working in public service whose skill and commitment are at the heart of our communities. And at this time of great anxiety and hardship, be it for those around the world facing conflict, famine or natural disaster, or for those at home finding ways to pay their bills and keep their families fed and warm, we see it in the humanity of people throughout our nations and the Commonwealth 
who so readily respond to the plight of others. I particularly want to pay tribute to all those wonderfully kind people who so generously give food or donations, or that most precious commodity of all, their time, to support those around them in greatest need. Together with the many charitable organizations which do such extraordinary work in the most difficult circumstances. Our churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, and gurdwaras have once again united in feeding the hungry, providing love and support throughout the year. Such heartfelt solidarity is the most inspiring expression of loving our neighbor as ourselves. The Prince and Princess of Wales recently visited Wales, shining a light on practical examples of this community spirit. Some years ago, I was able to fulfill a lifelong wish to visit Bethlehem and the Church of the Nativity. There I went down into the chapel of the manger and stood in silent reverence by the silver star that is inlaid on the floor and marks the place of our Lord Jesus Christ's birth. It meant more to me than I can possibly express to stand on that spot where, as the Bible tells us, the light that has come into the world was born. While Christmas is, of course, a Christian celebration, the power of light overcoming darkness is celebrated across the boundaries of faith and belief. So whatever faith you have or whether you have none, it is in this life-giving light and with the true humility that lies in our service to others that I believe we can find hope for the future. Let us therefore celebrate it together and cherish it always. With all my heart, I wish each of you a Christmas of peace, happiness, and everlasting light. We've got one more uh, scripture reading. This is uh, Psalm 78, and if I could have a volunteer read that, please. David. This is from Psalm 78, verses 1 to 6. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known, that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might, and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children, that next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Okay, thank you. So again, this psalm is, again, similar to the Deut Deuteronomy reading, talking about uh, telling the story to the next generation, making sure that the, the faith is passed down. And so <clears throat> we're going to give the last word of tonight's session and of our whole series to the Queen herself. This is her Christmas message in 2000. And this one in particular, she's, she's quite uh, overt in talking about her faith. And, uh, and so I thought we would close with this. It's very, it's not a very good, unfortunately, it's very um, scratchy, but I think it should be fine. Christmas is the traditional, if not the actual birthday of a man who was destined to change the course of our history. And today we are celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ was born 2000 years ago. This is the true millennium anniversary. simple facts of Jesus' life give us little clue as to the influence he was to have on the world. As a boy, he learned his father's trade as a carpenter. He then became a preacher, recruiting 12 supporters to help him. 
But his ministry only lasted a few years, and he himself never wrote anything down. In his early 30s, he was arrested, tortured, and crucified with two criminals. His death might have been the end of the story, but then came the resurrection, and with it, the foundation of the Christian faith. Even in our very material age, the impact of Christ's life is all around us. The image of the Madonna and child is particularly familiar to us during this Christmas season. If you want to see an expression of Christian faith, you only have to look at our awe-inspiring cathedrals and abbeys, listen to their music, or look at their stained glass windows, their books, and their pictures. But the true measure of Christ's influence is not only in the lives of the saints, but also in the good works quietly done by millions of men and women day in and day out through the centuries. Many will have been inspired by Jesus' simple but powerful teaching, love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. In other words, treat others as you would like them to treat you. His great emphasis was to give spirituality a practical purpose. Whether we believe in God or not, I think most of us have a sense of the spiritual, that recognition of a deeper meaning and purpose in our lives. And I believe that this sense flourishes despite the pressures of our world. This spirituality can be seen in the teachings of other great faiths. Of course, religion can be divisive, but the Bible, the Quran, and the sacred texts of the Jews and Hindus Buddhists and Sikhs are all sources of divine inspiration and practical guidance passed down through the generations. To many of us, our beliefs are of fundamental importance. For me, the teachings of Christ and my own personal accountability before God provide a framework in which I try to lead my life. I, like so many of you, have drawn great comfort in difficult times from Christ's words and example. I believe that the Christian message, in the words of a familiar blessing, remain profoundly important to us all. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted, honor all men. It is a simple message of compassion, and yet as powerful as ever today, 2,000 years after Christ's birth. I hope this day will be as special for you as it is for me. May I wish you all a very happy Christmas. She did, um, just to your point, Joan, I mean, she did, she did make a, a pretty strong uh, effort there to be inclusive, I think, and talk, she's talking about her own faith, but then also talked about other religions um, mm -hmm. and the value of those as well, so to be fair. And that's, that's 20 years ago, 23 years ago that she said that, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming and spending time with me the last uh, five weeks. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed this topic. It's been an inspiration for me to, to go through all this and, uh, and uh, think about these themes that are coming. So thank you. Very much.